the ground is difficult. The Russians have a couple of disadvantages, which I'll talk about in a moment. And the morning of the 5th of November, 1854, dawns very, very foggily, which will be the most enormous asset to the small number of British who are defending the position and a, a great disadvantage to the large number of Russians who are attacking. If you're going to attack, you need to you need to attack broadly in a proportion of three or four to one. The Russians are attacking in probably or five or six to one. The British defences are, 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 are weak. They've only got one division, namely the second division. They've been mauled at the Alma. And they're also tired from, from not only um, guarding this flank, but also having to carry out the siege duties inside Sevastopol. The Russians slightly miscalculate. Soymanov, uh, you can see him top left, he's meant to come along St. George's Ravine, get his guns in position on Shell Hill. You can see the Russian gun line top part of the map and then pause, maybe, maybe engage the British pickets. It doesn't matter too much. And wait for Pavlov, top right, you can see, to cross the River Chenea. That's the little bit of river you can just see sticking out top right corner of the map and join him up on these heights so that he's going to be presenting the British with a gusting maybe 60,000, some, somewhere about 60,000 troops um, with whom he will be attacking. And remarkably, remarkably, they, they finally assess that 92, 92 Russian guns are going to be eventually be in place on Shell Hill, which, as you will remember, from the 26th of October, has now been thoroughly reconnoitred. Well, the Russians know exactly the range to Shell Hill. They're much, much stronger in artillery, much stronger in manpower, but they're attacking, they're not defending. And the great difficulty, having a lot of guns is great, a lot of ammunition is even better, but the difficulty with that is the fact that, of course, you're not firing from static, pre-prepared positions where you know exactly what you're firing at. Secondly, you're actually arriving just as dawn is coming. And thirdly, it's blinking foggy. So although the, the guns on Shell Hill are well within, sorry, the guns on Home Ridge, the British guns on Home Ridge, are well within range of the Russians, the small number, and it's probably no more than initially, is no more than about 18 British guns initially. These 18 guns firing, a, let's say, about 60 or 70 Russian guns as they come up, they have a huge advantage in terms of knowing exactly where they're firing and firing from pre-prepared defensive positions with plenty of ammunition being available. Nonetheless, the Russians hugely outnumber. Soymanov commits his troops too quickly in the fog. His, his, his leading columns get drawn into the fight too quickly before Pavlov has arrived. The opening parts of the battle are remarkable in as much as small troops, small numbers of British troops, are managing to defend the left flank of the British position. Captain Clifford of the Rifle Brigade tells the most remarkable story. He comes forward with his brigade commander, who's a man called Buller. Uh, Buller's son, by the way, you, you, you probably know Buller's son from the Zulu War, where he wins a, a Victoria Cross at Kabani Mount, and then goes on to the South African War, where he doesn't distinguish himself quite well. Anyway, Buller Senior is not admired by Captain Clifford, who is his aide-de-camp, his young rifle brigade aide-de-camp. And as they, as they move forward for re with reinforcements along the edge of the careening ravine, which you can see there on the left-hand side, Buller suddenly says, what on earth do you think that is down there in the fog in front of us? To which, to which Clifford says, Brigadier, what, you know, what do you think it is? And he said, well, it looks to me like a very great number of Russian infantry. Yeah, well spotted, Brigadier. That's exactly what it is. Well, says, but what do you think we should do? Yeah, I tell you exactly what we should do. 77th Regiment, that's following me, with ball cartridge load. Spread yourselves out into assault, fix bayonets, and follow me. Well, Clifford, we don't really know what happens to the brigade commander, but Clifford spurs his horse forward with the 77th shouting and bellowing on either flank. He, he, Clifford himself engages a Russian. Russian soldier comes forward a little bit. 
but he pulls his musket up to defend himself from Clifford, who's on horseback, who's wielding his sword with a great deal of strength. The sword strikes the, the barrel of the, uh, of the musket, cuts all the way down the, 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 the barrel of the musket, and slices off poor old Ivan's right hand, uh, which is somewhere down on the lower part of the musket. A hand, let's say, it may not want his right hand. Anyway, the poor old Russian, of course, reels away, absolutely reels away with this grievous injury. Fast forward 24 hours, Clifford comes back to the field the, the, the day after the battle, goes to a dressing station and finds the Russian, the very Russian house. He know it's the Russian because this Russian comes out with a bandaged hand from the dressing station saying, Johnny, Johnny, Bono, Johnny, Johnny, Bono. In other words, Britisher, Britisher, you are a good fellow. Now, I'm not quite sure why he thinks he's a good fellow for cutting his hand off, but there we are. Clifford, one of the first Roman Catholic officers ever to be commissioned into the British Army, takes a bag of gold, throws it to the Russian who catches it with his good hand with, a, with an enormous smile on his face, and shouts, Bono, Johnny, Bono, and disappears into history. We don't know what happens. Anyway, the left-hand side, the left flank of the position is resisted. And at the same time, Pavlov's troops begin to start making an impression over on the top right flank towards the Sembag battery. The guards, three battalions of guards, you can see them middle right-hand side of the picture. They were actually labelled uh, 2nd Coldstream, 1st uh, Scots Fusilier Guards and 3rd Battalion of the Grenadier Guards. The guards are coming up, but the 41st of Welsh Regiment are holding the Sandbag Battery. Now, the Taratini, they, they are the first regiment to arrive opposite the Sandbag Battery. They are not part of Paulos forces, they're actually part of Soymanov's forces. And they leak right the way down from the left-hand side of the battlefield and they're attracted, obviously, to this, 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 um, uh, this um, battlefield magnus, as I would call it, this little British defence that's sitting on the right flank. Captain Hodosevich of the Taratini, he talks about the fact that they, they move up the ridge line, they move up these terribly strong, difficult, uh, uh, difficult ridges. The Russian artillery is firing hard now over the right shoulders through the fog. But as they come upon the sandbag battery, they don't know who they are, but they're actually the 41st or Welsh Regiment with their colours. And they're standing there. Captain Hamilton is, is, is standing with the regimental colour of the 41st. And the Taratini comes storming into the redoubt. It's a sandbag battery. It's about, it's a, it's a lunette. So it looks like a half moon. It's, a, it's about 40 foot, I suppose, uh, from the left tip to the right tip with two embrasures in it. And it's about 10 to 12 foot high of piled sandbags with sandbags with two embrasures in it for, to, 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 for the guns that, that are not there to fire through. Hodosevich says his men leap through the, um, through, through the embrasures, and they're then met immediately by volley firing 41st, who pour minier ammunition into them at close range, and then burn at them. They come in good and hard and, and burn at the Taratini, throw them out of the, uh, out of the sandbag battery. Taratini, four battalions strong, strongly counterattack the 400 strong 41st, 41st, eject the 41st, and suddenly the sandbag battery is in Russian hands. Well, don't hold your breath, Russians, because coming up hard are the battalions of the Brigade of Guards, the Grenadiers, the Coldstream, and the Scots Fusilier Guards. First to arrive, 1st Battalion, sorry, 3rd Battalion, the Grenadier Guards, who see what's going on in the sandbag battery. They pause, they gather their breath, the Duke of Cambridge, the brigade commander, is shortly behind them, just behind the brigade headquarters. They leave the colours of the 3rd Battalion of the Grenadier Guards. The men draw their breath. They fix bayonets. And then down the shallow ridge, they charge against the Taratini. And again, the same sort of performance goes on with the Taratini crossing bayonets with the 3rd Battalion of the Grenadier Guards firing as hard as they can to try to keep them away. But these bare-skinned, grey-coated soldiers in the fog get the better of the Russians, push them out of the sandbag battery. And then, as you can see from the, from the, uh, from, from, from the, the contour lines behind, the Russians spill back out of the battery and down into the valley, down to the right. Well, that's the first encounter of the sandbag battery. There are seven more 
captures and recaptures of the sandbag battery throughout the day. The stories are quite extraordinary. Well, MacDonald by now is the adjutant. He's been promoted because everybody else is dead or wounded as a result of the Alma. Been promoted to captain. He's he's now the adjutant. He was a light company subaltern of the 95th. And he is riding down on his horse, himself and the commanding officer, this chap called Champion, whose name I have mentioned before. Champion and MacDonald are riding down the ravine, bringing with them a wing of the 95th Regiment. So probably, oh, I don't know, about 200, quite small numbers of the 95th with them as reinforcements for the guards who are around the sandbag battery. MacDonald is terribly short-sighted. The, the ground is extremely unsuitable to be on horseback. It's broken, it's extremely steep. And as they dry, ride down with the troops behind them, with the soldiers behind them, through the fog, um, they suddenly hit by a by a by a, a smatter, a smatter, probably of shrapnel fire, maybe shell fire from the Russian guns that are firing at them through the fog from Shell Hill over their left shoulders. Major Champion says, "God, I'm hit! I'm hit!" And he falls from his horse. So the, the commanding officer of the 95th falls from his horse, whilst Macdonald. The adjutant dismounts and goes up to him and says, "Yeah, you, yeah, you've been struck through the thigh, sir, um, but but I'll, I'll get a bandage on that, um, and you, you'll be just fine." No, damn it, no, damn it, says Champion. Get the soldiers to do that. You turn round now, Macdonald, and get yourself back up the ravine and find the troops, find our reinforcements, and for God's sake, go and support the guards who are under serious pressure to our right rear inside the sandbag battery. Well, MacDonald, can't, he, he can't ride anymore. This ground's too steep. He leads his horse back up the ravine. And then he, to his great delight, immediately to in front of him, he sees a formed company of British troops. So it's foggy, hard to see them, but he can see their gray, gray coats. The Russians have removed their leather helmets, more of which in a moment. And they're wearing little soft, round, gray caps with gray great coats. The British are wearing little soft, slightly darker color round caps with gray great coats. So up goes MacDonald and he shouts out at the top of his voice, who are you? Who are you? So this, this, this gang of people that are standing in the, in the, in the fog and the, and the brush, uh, to which they shout out, da tovarish dosvidanya, or something along those lines. It's a company of blinking Russian infantry probably from the Selenginsk, who I'm going to talk about in a moment. They see MacDonald coming up, leading his horse, and they give him a good smattering of small arms fire, um, one round of which wounds him in the thigh, and then the Muscovites, as he would call them, come rushing forward at him with their bayonets. Now, luckily, private, there's one of the private soldiers from the Grenadier Company, who is also with MacDonald at the time, and MacDonald turns to this man, whose name is Cody, and says, get back, get back, save yourself, save yourself. No, sir, I can't possibly. Um, the Russians pour in upon poor old MacDonald and they burn at him. Maybe 18 times, it's not clear. But he ends up like, like a blinking pincushion on the ground. He's got his sword in his hand. He brings his, brings his sword up to defend himself. Um, a Russian officer comes up and he recognizes him as a Russian officer. And he says in French, Call your men off, for God's sake. Call your, I'm a gentleman, I'm an officer. Call your men off. And the Russian says, ha ha, comes in and cuts him across the head with his sabre. Now, by all accounts, well, by, by, if fate is right, that's the end of MacDonald. Stabbed, shot, and cut with a sabre. Well, next morning, so fast forward, the regiment sends out its, its uh, medical parties to pick up the wounded that are lying out on the field of, field of battle. And one of the soldiers says, good Lord, look, look, it's Captain MacDonald, it's the adjutant. They take off his shako. Now, it's not, it's not, it's not quite this shako, but it's, it's, it's the earlier pattern, but it's, this is actually MacDonald's shako from, a, from 1855. So and they say the shako is full of blood, completely full of blood. So they carry out the famous and, and extremely technical test on whether, whether a, a man is dead or whether, whether he has, has still got breath in his body. Uh, does he, do they put a mirror to his mouth? Do they feel for a pulse? Nope. One man catches him under the knees. The other one catches him under the shoulders. 
they lift him up two foot and then they drop him. Now, if the wounded man goes, oh, God blimey, or worse to that effect, he's alive. If he doesn't say anything, he's dead. Well, MacDonald is clearly alive. They pack him off. They get him back. Blah, blah. That's fine. Fast forward again, sorry, to the following year, by which time MacDonald comes back to the regiment, having recovered. He goes to the field of Inkerman. He goes to the bush under which he's lain. He cuts a stick. He cuts a stick, which looks a bit like this. It's not actually, that's not McDonald's. That's not from the 55th, but he cuts a stick that will end up looking a bit like this as a walking stick. You know how keen the Victorians are on the walking sticks. And eventually, when he gets back to Portsmouth, he takes the stick into a jeweler there, explains his story and says, right, I'd like this stick mounted in silver, please. Can you do that? And I, yeah, no doubt with sort of regimental inscriptions on it, this, that, and the other. And the Judas says, absolutely fine. About ready in three weeks, sir. So he comes back in three weeks. He's got that stick of mine. Yep, here it is, sir. And he passes in the stick and it's, and it's all done up in tissue paper. He takes the tissue paper off the stick. Must have looked very much like this. And he says, oh, that's absolutely beautiful. But you've mounted it in gold and not in silver. And the jeweler says, yes. He says, well, it's going to cost me a blinky fortune for you to do that. And the tailor, and, they, and the, 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 the jeweler says, well, we would, sir, but this is our present to a British hero. Now, MacDonald carries that stick for the rest of his life. He ends up as the commandant of, of Edinburgh Castle, the, 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 the fort major, and he, he actually dies. He lives on the Isle of Man, but he actually dies relatively young in the 1870s, never having married, never having anybody else, and, and therefore Sadly, there's no one to inherit any of these things. However, they have come to light. Talk about that. But let's go back to Anthony Morgan. Now, Anthony Morgan's this bloke here in the picture behind me. I've talked about him endlessly. And his story is simply that he's fighting slightly further back. He's not down at the, at the sandbag battery, but he's fighting slightly further back at another defensive position called the barrier. Uh, the barrier is held by this, a small number of men. Um, probably no more than six or seven hundred throughout the day. Sandbag battery similarly has to resist the, these constant onslaughts against the Russians. The stories are just extraordinary. Um, they're, not, they're not just extraordinary from the British, but they're extraordinary from the Russians as well. Um, this, let me just show you this picture here. It's not a particularly, well, it's not terribly clear here, but this shows Russian infantry. I'll get it a bit close. This shows Russian infantry in action. And looking at it, you'd think, aha, that's the Crimea, quite clearly the Crimea. No, it's not. It's not. It's exactly a year before, exactly a year before, what, one day out, 4th of November, 1853, when Pavlov's gang, so the lot that have come up as reinforcements, they're fighting the Turks down on the Danube, and the Russians get a right good cloth at the Battle of Altenitsa, Altenitsa, which, you know, I challenge anybody to, to, to put that on the map. I can just because I spent bloody ages looking for it. But, but, but the, the Turks get the better of the Russians. And the particular heroes of that battle, are, oh, the good old Selenginsk, here we are. That's one of the helmets that they would have worn at Altenitsa, you can see the numbers 21 there on the front. They're not wearing these, so they, they get to the Crimea wearing these summits, but in action they wear the soft little caps that we've been talking about. They, they've been in action against the Turks exactly a year before. They, they arrive on the 3rd of November after having marched in from Bessarabia, which is, I don't know, actually, it's at least 300 miles, 280 miles, something like that, long, long march, long march. And they're told, by the way, you're attacking tomorrow over ground that you don't know against people that do know the ground extremely well, namely the British. And you're going to find yourself um, linking up with troops from the, who, who know the ground, who are coming out from Sebastopol. And there is a representation, there's a deputation from the troops that go to the, the officers and say, look, hang on a minute, sir, look. Um, Exactly a year ago, so so on the 4th of November, we got a right good scene to by the Turks. We're, we're, we're superstitious people. Uh, we're deeply religious. We're deep, deeply superstitious as well. We don't want to attack on the first anniversary of a defeat. The Russian high command say, OK, yeah, we buy that. We absolutely buy that. 
and therefore they delay it by one day. <laughs> nonetheless, nonetheless, regiments like the Selangis are going into action um, with this hideous memory that they've had uh, of, of the year before. And actually, the British say that when they strip the bodies of the Russian dead, which which they do, it's a customary thing. Both sides will strip the, the before they get buried. The bodies will be stripped. Many, many, many of the Russians, all of whom are described as being um, well muscled, uh, not terribly tall, but athletically built young men, many of them bearing the marks of former wounds. Now, where have they come from? Well, uh, clearly we don't know, but I can only imagine these are Paulos men that clashed with the Turks the year before. And any of you that have had the pleasure of, of, of meeting fast moving metal. Um, at an earlier stage of your career, will we'll know that, that, that a wound um, takes it out of you, you know, in, in, in big time. I, I, I sympathise with these men, and they attack incredibly bravely. It's not just the selling heats, clearly, it's the Arcots, the alternate, the, 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 um, uh, the Taratini, um, all sorts of different Russian regiments, the Vladimir, the Moscow regiment, the Azov regiment, etc. Um, they come on time and time and time again up these dreadfully difficult uh, gullies that I have mentioned. Their priests are right in the front rank with them, dressed in, in canonical clothes, with next to the priest will be a young soldier carrying a, a religious icon. The drums will be beating on either side of them. And they come time and time again, mob-handed, to meet man fighting, fighting mad British who are in the glens and the glades and the fog and the drizzle um, underneath the pounding Russian artillery fire, certainly advantaged by having a rifle rather than a musket, which is much harder hitting than the Russian musket. Nonetheless, um, the gallantry of both sides, I, I'm not, I'm not going to for one moment say that the Russians cut and run or that the British had a huge advantage. Um, any advantage that the British had was moral because of far, far new, fewer numbers. Probably at, at best, the British put about 8,000 troops into action on the top of, of Home Bridge. The Russians are certainly facing that with no less than 20 and maybe 30, possibly 40,000 troops at the best of times, supported by 92 guns. So very unevenly matched. But the British know the ground. They know every single dip, every bush. They've been they've been on this ground for six weeks beforehand, um, and they know it intimately. Now, again, I can spend the next several hours describing the ins and outs of all of these things. The battle goes on from dawn right the way through until one o'clock in the afternoon. The casualties on both sides are extraordinary. They are mainly inflicted by the, the artillery of both sides, and then the infantry fighting, when it occurs, certainly starts with the discharge of muskets and rifles, but very quickly devolves or degenerates into bayonet fighting. Um, and there are many, many casualties, both Russian and British, uh, that are seen the day after the fighting with their features completely unrecognizable, probably having been dropped with a bayonet and then finished off with the butt of a musket or a rifle. Private Palmer, for instance, of 3rd Battalion, the Grenadier Guards, He's trying to support his officer um, who's counterattacking through the embrasures of, the, uh, of, of, the, um, of the, the sandbag battery. He talks about leaping amongst the Muscovites, dropping a Muscovite to the ground with, with, with a single thrust of the bayonet. That Muscovite, who is obviously is, is, is that Russian, who is wounded rather than dead, then grabs him round the knees on the, on the ground. Another Russian comes at him. He shoots. One of the Russians, clearly he has a single single shot weapon with his rifle. He puts that Russian down and he disappears into the into the, the fur and the fog. But the next Russian comes at him and stabs him through the cheek. The bayonet goes in here and it comes out here on the other side of his face. He says he just has time to realize that he can spit teeth out from his mouth before he has time to pull back from the Russian that stabbed him and club the Russian to the, to the ground. Meanwhile, trying to kick the Russian that's holding him round the, uh, round the knees. The Sergeant Major, Sergeant Major Agar, so, so what would now be called the regimental Sergeant Major, shouts at Palmer, don't kick a man when he's down. Uh, 
Palmer has a rather different idea about all of this. He's trying to get after his officers and trying to save them. There's a moment of huge crisis when, when the guards pursue the Russians over the, over the lip of the sandbag battery and go back down, right down into the bottom of the valley, trying to chase them. The 20th or East, East Devonshire Regiment, they, they follow them. 21st Royal North British Fusiliers, 95th or Derbyshire Regiment, they also pursue them. They get outflanked. The Russians come behind them and suddenly they're in low ground with the Russians above them, not just in front of them, but now behind them as well. Captain MacDonald of the 95th, he describes that he gets down into the bottom of the valley and suddenly he's aware of Frenchmen, Zouaves, in other words, um, French soldiers dressed in, 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 in North African native costume. These are the reinforcements that I'll talk about in a moment. But Zouaves are coming up behind him, um, rushing down the valley, screaming and shouting, with the great white spats flashing in, 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 the, in the fog and the, and the drizzle. Uh, one of these Zouaves comes rushing past MacDonald, sees two Russians in front of him, stabs one, butts the other one to the ground with his rifle, and MacDonald says, thank you. To which the Zouave replies in perfect English, no, thank you, old boy. It's so nice to see you again. Now, MacDonald hasn't the slightest, uh, sorry, Carmichael, I'm sorry if I've been using the word, but Carmichael hasn't the slightest idea who this Zouave is. But the Zouaves at this time are a sort of foreign legion. And this is probably an English gentleman of some sort that's ended up as a private soldier in the Zouaves, complete with beard and moustaches and turban and all that stuff. And he disappears back into the fog. Well, you know, who on earth is this? What's that meeting all about? They have to fight back up the hill, back into the sandbag battery. Meanwhile, the French are arriving, more artillery is arriving. And to cut an extremely long story short, by around about midday, by around about midday, something like that, the British and the reinforced or the reinforced British artillery, the French artillery, is finally getting the better part of the Russian guns up on Shell Hill. The final note of the of the of the exchange of shot and shell belongs to the ba the barrier. So the the, the, the organisation that's uh, that's to the left of the sandbag battery at the barrier, um, they detect that the Russian fire, the Russian artillery fire, is slackening, and a Captain Ackland of the seventy seventh Regiment, he decides that he's going to go up with his company up the hill and to try and counterattack the Russian guns that are firing up from, 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 from Shell Hill. He says to him, come on, men, follow me. And the men melt away. They melt away into the, into the fur and the brush and the fog. And he says, come on, come on, what's wrong with you? Get after me, come on. To which there is no response. These are men that have fought five, six hours, hard, hand-to-hand -hand with the Russians. No wonder they're tired. No wonder they're scared. Of course they're scared, but they're exhausted as well. Acton says, well, well, fine. If you won't follow me, then I will go by myself. He draw, I don't know why, he's, why his sword's in his scabbard, but he draws his sword and heads back up Shell Hill by himself. And, uh, and eventually a corporal stands up and says, damn it, damn it. We can't leave him by himself, men. Come on. And this company of the 77th with a few member, few, few men of the 2nd Battalion of the Rifle Brigade, they mount an uphill bayonet charge against the Russian guns, which are now being heavily pummeled by the British and the French artillery on the top of the ridge. It's the moment of victory. This one example by a junior officer, by a handful of British troops, manages to overcome or to get in amongst the Russian gun line and cause the Russian guns to start withdrawing, a little bit like the Alma, which we discussed a couple of weeks ago. I can go on and on and on about this. By about two o'clock in the afternoon, 8,000 British reinforced by um, maybe six or 7,000 Frenchmen who don't really get into action very much. I'm not denigrating the French for one moment. I can, but I won't at the moment. Um, they beat about 40,000 Russians actually in actions, many more on the field of battle, but they, they force the Russians back by virtue of the fog, by virtue of the fact that the Russians cannot properly see their targets, by virtue of the fact that the Russians don't properly know the ground, and by virtue of good old fashioned British pluck. And instead of waiting for officers to tell them what to do, private soldiers, junior non-commissioned officers and subaltern simply taking the war to the enemy 
all the disadvantages I've just described and are not overcome by the heavy preponderance of artillery. Um, the weather, the ground, their lack of uh, their lack of familiarity with the ground, and in some in some cases poor lower level leadership means that the Russians are pushed back. At the end of the day, there could well have been about sixty thousand troops, one way or another, at its height on the battlefield. But of those 60,000, there are 5,000. 5,000 are dead. Probably three or 4,000 Russians and slightly over 1,000 British and a handful of Frenchmen. The fact remains that although the Russians lose the battle, they so badly degrade the British fighting power and to a lesser extent the French fighting power that the Allies attempt to get into Sevastopol before the winter, which is clearly what they're trying to do, fails. The British and the French simply now do not have the manpower to prosecute the siege successfully. It's going to take at least eight months before the British and French can reinforce in such a way that they can have a go at Sevastopol, which they do in June 1855, and that fails. So there we are. I will finish with this little couplet. Remember, remember, the 5th of November, gunpowder, bayonets, and shot. When General Liprandi charged Tom, Pat and Sandy, and a damn fine licking he got. <laughs>